Hey everyone, this is Kamran and today's video is about the system design basics. We're not going to go into the depth of each of the items that we'll be covering, but this is to give you a high level overview of all the bits and pieces of the system design and how they fit together to make the application work. When a user opens the website, the first thing that they interact with is the browser. Let's say that a user wants to open the website google.com. For browser to open the website, it needs to know where this website is located. To find out where it is located, it uses something called the DNS which stands for domain name system and it is responsible for telling us where the website is located. There is much more details about how it works and how the website is found on the internet but we are not going to cover in this video. We will do that in the future videos. For now just know that the browser sends it the name of the website and it gives us back the IP address of the website where the website is located. Now that the browser has got the IP address of the website it knows where the application servers are. So it can make a call to the server and get back the web page of the website. Now that the browser has received the website, it can start rendering the web page. This web page might have different kinds of static assets, such as the style sheets, images, and the JavaScript files. Now, all these files can either be served from the single server, the original server where our website is, or people normally put them on the CDNs. So CDN stands for Content Delivery Networks, and these are special kinds of servers which are located all across the globe, and serving the assets from there is much faster than serving from the single server. Let's understand the reason for that by taking an example. So here I have an example server which doesn't use the CDN to serve its static assets. So as you can see here our server is sitting on one corner of the world and our users are on the other side of the world. Now since the distance between our users and the servers is much higher, the request will be slow because the request has to go through several hops to reach us and getting the static assets from the server is time consuming. Also we are putting all the load on our server because we are hosting all the static assets. Now let's look at the same example with the use of CDN. As you can see here the requests instead of coming to our servers are going to the black dots which are the CDNs. And whatever the closest server is to the user the request will be served from there. And also the static assets will be cached here so the response times will be much lower than coming from the server and getting the assets from there. Also apart from the faster response times the load on our server is going to be much lower because we are not serving all the assets they are coming from the CDNs. And again we are just scratching the surface of the CDN. We are going to cover this in much more detail in the future videos. Now let's talk about the server. So on the server side if we start getting a high load of traffic our resources on the server might exhaust and you might have to increase the resources to support the high load of traffic. So let's say that if we had 500 MB of RAM and it's not able to keep up with the load of traffic that we are getting we might increase it to 2 GB let's say to support the traffic that we are getting. This process of increasing the capacity of the existing resources such as the CPU, RAM or memory is called vertical scaling. Vertical scaling although works and it might be a suitable option for some time, it is not always a viable option. And the reason for that is because there is a limit to the capacity that you can increase on the server. And also because having one server gives us one point of failure. So if our one server goes down, our application will go down. The other option is to go with the horizontal scaling which means to add more resources to serve the requests. Which means that we have more servers which are handling our requests instead of having just one server. But we can't just add servers and it will work. We need to divide the traffic among these servers equally. So to do that we implement something called a load balancer. So load balancer is responsible for identifying the servers which are available and distributing the traffic among them equally. Next in the modern application architectures such as microservices or SOA there might be several services that these servers will be talking to. For example there might be a service for registration and authentication, there might be a separate API for sending emails and so on. Communication between these APIs is normally done with the help of RESTful APIs or gRPC or with the help of the message queues. We will be covering these architectural styles in much more depth in the future videos. But I just wanted to highlight the different architectural styles here with which these APIs might be set up. Next we have storage. There might be different kinds of storages that an application might be using. First of all we have database that you probably already know that is to store the application data in there. There are different kinds of databases such as SQL, NoSQL and graph databases. For example there is Postgre, MySQL, MariaDB, MongoDB, Neo4j and so on. We'll be covering when to use what and the databases in much more detail in the future when we talk about the databases. Next we have caching which is the place where we store the results of expensive computations to save time and the resources. 
So for example, if you had a query or some calculation which takes around 5 seconds, you might do it once and then cache it for some time in the caching layer and return from there to make your subsequent requests faster. For the caching, you can use something like Redis or Memcache or there are several other options which you can go with. And then we have cloud storage such as S3 where we store the application content such as any kind of PDF files or database backups and so on. And next we have the data warehouse which is the place where we dump loads and loads of data to perform the analysis on that. There are different services available which you can use for that. For example, I have used Snowplow in the past or there is also AWS Firehose and so on. And next, most of the application have some kind of logging service which is used to monitor and check the logs to make sure that everything is working properly. The most famous one is ELK stack which is where all the logs are dumped and then it can be visualized or searched through. Next we have messaging and queues which are used to perform background or asynchronous operations. So for example when a user registers if you want to trigger them an email or to notify the customer support you can do this stuff with the help of messaging and queues. There is RabbitMQ, there is NATS and there are multiple other services which can be used to implement the messaging and queues. There are multiple different ways and patterns of using the messaging and queues and I have written an article in the past on how we were using it in my last company and we'll be learning more about them in the future videos. And the last one we have today is the search engine which are used to implement the full text search capabilities in our application. So for example if you have used amazon.com you might have seen that when you search for a book it shows you all the books matching the specific criteria that you gave. This is normally implemented using the search engines. So for example there are tools such as Sphinx, Elasticsearch or Solar which can be used to implement the full text search capabilities. And with that, our lesson comes to an end. I'll be doing a series of videos in the coming weeks covering each of the topics that we covered in this video in much more detail and giving you the practical tips on using them. Thank you for watching and I will see you next week.